some communities, um, you know, when um, when presiders in like worship services like yeah. do this, um, it's the presider and then it's the blessing onto people. So, um, but in some communities, then the um, the congregation, if you will, also then extends the blessing back to the person who presides, and so you actually do a blessing twice, so that everybody has has given a blessing and everybody has been blessed. Um, so, about three months ago, when I or a couple months ago, when I was thinking about my last class, I thought, you know, what's what's how do like some of you I talked to like how do you end right like the like beat 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 that's all folks like on here or like do a little cane and a top hat and just like dance right on out and just be like you know I was thinking about doing a mic drop I think about doing mic drop you know Jackson Obama did that but Obama just did it so that yeah he did it uh, so um, so what I what I and I love this blessing is um, so at the very end what I would love to do is I'd like to close with this blessing that I will. Um, that I will uh, uh, speak to you, and then uh, and then say, and I'll have you all stand when we get to there, and then um, uh, and then I'd invite you to say the blessing to me. That's how I want to end. <laughs> I plan for these things, right? Yes, you do. <laughs> Our uh, former dean, uh, when he left in 2008, after 28 years, I met him in the hall after his um, last class, or it was a few minutes after. He goes, well, that was that. And I said, what? He goes, my, my end of 28 years of teaching. I said, what did you guys do? Did you, you know, like, he said, oh, I, I don't even know if he mentioned it. I was like, oh, I'm not doing that. Like, we're, we're, we're doing all that. So, um, so does that work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got yeah. that? All right. And that's how we'll end our, end our time. Okay. So I did a last lecture that Manabu had organized, right, a few weeks ago. But for this class, and now we have some um, extra guests and visitors. Oh, it makes me a little nervous. That's okay. Um, Pressure's on. But I have, what's that? Pressure's okay, on. Okay, all right. But, um, uh, but you're all friends, and I appreciate that. And, and um, I've, been, I've been not looking forward to this day for a long time. Um, but if there's a group I wanted to go out with, I think this was the one. So that's why you know, I said I appreciate your, your time to do that, um, to be here which I'll probably say in a second, but, um, so, uh, yes, here we go. I, uh, some of you know I'm a numbers guy, I like numbers, so I had to figure out some numbers. Um, this is the end of my 15th year at Trinity. Uh, we used to be on quarters, now we're on semesters. That comes out to 36 academic terms that I've taught, plus one semester I had on sabbatical leave. Um, I've taught 115 classes, 114 and then this one. Um, 55 of those full classes, 60 more seminar style, you know, SLP, college success. I've had some of you for those. Uh, supervised 24 independent studies, 68 senior internships, and altogether 1,808 students. And so 13 of you, um, uh, this is the last 13 of 1,800. Um, uh, but the numbers that perhaps have, met mo have been the most important to me over the years is one, one, and one one semester at a time, one class at a time, and one student at a time. And I've really tried to, to, um, to live that way, not about accumulating these uh, numbers, which are sometimes even shocking to me. Uh, and, and 15, okay, I haven't done anything 15 years. I didn't go to school, I didn't go to grade school, or you know, K-12 okay, isn't 15 years. I haven't been married 15 years. I've never lived anywhere 15 years, well, except, I guess, growing up. Um, so it's not like forever, like, it's not like it's 40 years, right? But, but I still haven't done anything for more than 15 years other than this. So that's what's maybe kind of shocking to me is like, well, I haven't, you know, I haven't done anything else this long. Um, but again, I think that um, one student at a time, uh, one class at a time, one semester at a time. So as I said, it's an honor uh, to have my last class at Trinity be this one. And in, and in many ways, um, I may have mentioned, we didn't really need to meet for class today, you know, debrief the, the presentations or whatever. I don't think we're gonna do that. Don't have assessment stuff to do this year. Um, but I wanted to, and I appreciate uh, you allowing me this uh, opportunity to kind of be together one last time. Um, it's not uh, necessarily all about me, but again, I, as we had a chance to earlier in our time, celebrate together uh, the end of this class, the end of your college studies, because you are all graduating. Here, here. Those of you, in this class. you know, by the end of graduation, we're just going to be 
We're, we're going to be stay. glad. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> and of course, um, again, this very uh, this wonderful celebration for you and, and time for you again is this unique time in the life of this college after 72 years, the end of our time at Trinity. And so, so it's not just seniors; it's faculty, it's staff, it's juniors, it's sophomores, um, it's first year students. And just like when I did the last lecture uh, down in the commons, you know, the question is, what is there to say? Like, how do you sum up? How do you, you know, what am I supposed to emphasize? Um, you know, but again, I don't refuse the opportunity. And so maybe Dave's top 10, I, what, that wasn't quite what inspired it, but I just picked out a few things that, um, that I think are uh, more from the heart, not so much about from my classes. And some of these things maybe you've heard before, and other ones I realized as I was kind of writing this out, uh, yesterday is that maybe some of these things you haven't heard from me, but they're what kind of undergird or a foundation, hopefully, for what I've uh, taught or, or what I've tried to be in this place. So, um, so I think there's uh, about seven things here to just kind of throw out to you somewhat sporadically. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. The first one, uh, God doesn't have a plan for your life. Too often, and you maybe heard me say this, I talked about it in service learning practicum a little bit, is I think that we work ourselves weary trying to figure out God's plan for our life. I often have drawn the safe on the board, right? And it's this idea that we're trying to like find out that magic combination to what is God's plan for my life? It's some super secret thing, like there was some chip embedded in me that I'm supposed to decode in some way. Um, you know, we're waiting for a, the sign of the, you know, the writing in the sky, the, the brick to be thrown at us that's got it written or to go to the mailbox someday. And we kind of like, what is God's plan? What is the sign? And I think um, sometimes we made it into the super secret thing. And one of the things that I've, I feel I've learned and I hopefully I'm trying to pass on is that God's plan for our lives has already been revealed. And that's in waking up in the morning and living, living the day. That God invites us, not to something grand and big in the future, but God calls us to the present, um, to what's in our, our lives today, the here, the now, the right now. Um, and that God has um, provided this day as a, as a precious and sacred gift and a sacred trust. And perhaps that became uh, clear to me, uh, or more clear to me, when uh, in his late 20s, my brother-in-law was killed in a car accident and left behind two kids. And um, what I realized um, that day was that um, all the planning you do for tomorrow uh, doesn't matter because there may not be one. And so how do you, um, how do you uh, experience um, the joy of the present without worrying about the future? So, um, and, and by the way, Dave Ellingson agrees with me on this one too, if you ever talk to him, right? That God does not have a plan for your life. Um, some super secret plan that you gotta figure out or de decode, but again, live your life today and I think that's what God's plan is for our lives. Uh, secondly, listen to people who love you. Listen to people who love you. Moms, dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, children, siblings, mentors, friends, classmates, whoever it is. Because um, sometimes they know you better than you know yourself. That uh, they believe in you when you don't believe in yourself. Some of you even maybe named that earlier. And... Um, for many of you, um, it's listening to those people who know you and love you that got you to this place in life anyways. Um, and see, I'm right, <laughs> that you should listen to those people who love you. One of my favorite stories about uh, call and vocation is actually the calling of David. Because it wasn't David who decided that he was called. Remember, he was anointed. He was recognized um, uh, and, and called by the, through the recognition of somebody else. God, um, God called David through another person. And so um, I always love it talking to students when they say, yeah, you know, so-and-so tells me I'm really good at this, or I should consider this, or my mom's encouraging me this, or my own kids are telling me this. And it's like, well, why don't you listen to that? Why is that not God? Or how is that not God speaking to you through other people? Um, and in those days that you don't think you're anything special, we all have them, um, Listen to the people who love you because sometimes they know you better than you know yourself. Number three, take care of the kids. If you want to save the world, love children. Sue's in the room. <laughs> Hopefully she's tried to instill this in you. And many of you know this and you've experienced this. Uh, through your classes and through practicum and internships. Um, this world needs more adults that love kids. 
And um, as I think about many of you in this room, Michaela and Julianne and Michaela and Sarah and, and, and Jasmine, some of you, um, you have this incredible love for children, incredible passion for children. Um, and you need to love them and you need to fight for them. And you need to speak uh, on behalf of those who have um, no voice or very little voice. And again, I think if you want to change the world, take care of the kids. And then, uh, number four, uh, is to empower women. If you want to uh, save the world, love kids. If you want to change the world, empower other women. Um, I think everybody should be a feminist. Um, and being a feminist is not about radical ideals, although some feminists are that way. Um, but, but simply, uh, being a feminist is simply believing that women and men are to be seen as equals. Um, and perhaps that in itself is a radical idea, isn't it? Um, I tell my son Isaac that there's nothing a man can do that a woman cannot do, except for one thing, and he knows what it is. What is it? <laughs> Have a baby. Have a baby. Yep. And grow fish. Remember. And he and and then, <laughs> and then I got corrected because then he asked about my whiskers, and he said, "Well, um, do um, do moms, meaning women, do they also get them?" I did want to tell him that some do. <laughs> um, but I did say, I said, well, no, um, often, they, often, uh, no, often they don't. And then he said, but dad, you said there was only one thing that was different between men and women, but there's actually two. So he pointed out, he's come up with those two things. Um, I really hope that's a message I will continue to give to my sons. And I think that's a message we need to give to everybody else. That there's nothing that a, that a woman can't do that a man can as well. Um, and um, and I, I really strive to be a feminist, and this may be one of those things that I'm not really vocal about, but undergirds a lot of, uh, of maybe what I do. Um, I also kind of think uh, in the last few years why that might be why the CYFS program has so many women in it. Um, there has been a change in our program, you know, more around social community services. I think there's also a change in ministry where there's a lot more women involved as opposed to, to men in the past. Um, but honestly, I think um, as a part of that, when I have energy to give to, re when I've had energy in the past to give to recruitment, um, I do all I can to recruit women, to give them this place, this opportunity. And, um, and I, it's not like a, a, a bias or anything, but I even think when it's come down to scholarships, if I've been on the line, sometimes I'll choose the female if it's you know, between people, because I think men have had a lot of shots of, at life. Um, that I think are sometimes been un unfair in our history. So I try to do what I can, and, and maybe that's why I've <laughs> I look around the room. Sorry, Nels. <laughs> 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 um, but um, I, I, think, um, I think that's part of why I've recruited a lot of young women to this program is because that's been intentional, to give uh, women a place uh, and a voice and an opportunity. Um, and maybe you didn't know that, but I think that kind of undergirds a lot of who I am. I'm also careful about the language that I use for human beings and languages and images I use for God, because I think that um, providing girls and women the opportunity to see the feminine nature of God, who is above gender, not only the masculine, we often have, you know, say, well, well, does that mean God's a female? Mm, I don't know. But if you ask most people, is God male or female? You know what they'll say. They'll say they're, they're that, that God is male. And I wonder if that's unfair and does not give uh, girls and women these um, opportunities um, to explore um, the, uh, the greater uh, divinity and the nature of God. And uh, much of what we do in empowering women, I think, is to question systems of injustice and oppression on macro scales, but also in our daily interactions, particularly with young girls and with teens and, and with our um, colleagues who are women. So empower women. Number five, slow down. Slow the hell down. <laughs> the frantic pace of life is unsustainable. In our class, we talked a lot about margin. And when margin is depleted, one of my favorite sayings from Richard Swenson is that joy is an early casualty. That when we run so thin and so uh, unempty or beyond empty, where we're depleted, we're in that negative margin, joy becomes the casualty. Um, uh, humans walk on average about three miles an hour, 3.1, I looked it up. But there's a book that's titled The Three Mile an Hour God. Have you ever heard of it? Three Mile an Hour of God. <clears throat> it's a reminder that God is not in a hurry. Through history, God is not in a hurry. 
<clears throat> even Jesus, yes, uh, Mark will say immediately he went, immediately he went. But if you read a lot of the Gospels, Jesus takes time, stops, be with people, takes a nap, a rest. Why are you sleeping in the boat at the Garden of Gethsemane? Um, Jesus takes a break. Um, working, uh, so God is not in a hurry. Uh, working harder and faster, going on less sleep, doing more than we can physically handle does not find you any more favor with God. And I think people in Christian ministry or, or who seek to serve uh, God um, think that working harder and working more somehow brings about favor. So don't go 80 miles an hour when God moves at three. Otherwise, you'll miss out on a lot of the stuff that otherwise gets lost in the blur. And I think in the blur as it goes by, there's a lot of things that God has to show us and to bless us with, so slow down. Number six, get rid of checklist Christianity. The idea that you have to do something or be something that finds favor with God. Do this, do this, do this. Don't do that or this, but be this or be that. And I think that a lot of Christians carry around like this little checklist. And I encourage you to rip it up. Rip up that checklist. You'll never measure up to such standards. You will fail miserably. You'll fall short. But it's a stupid exercise anyway because you've already found favor. Through uh, with God, through the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and the continual reign of Jesus Christ. Somebody pointed out to me one time in the Apostles' Creed, if you read the second article in it where it says, you know, it talks about um, uh, uh, Jesus had suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried. It's all past tense, right? Um, uh, rose again, ascended to heaven. Notice it's all past tense. And is, and now we go to the present. And we live in this place where all that stuff has already happened. It's already been there. And we're somewhere between ascension and the uh, eventual return. So there's not much uh, that I think you have to do. Um, you can never be too foolish, too stubborn, too terrible, too out of reach, too far gone to fall out of favor in the sight of God. Remember the lost sheep, the one out of 100? God cares for the one as much as the 99. And in fact, in that story, remember, Jesus le or the shepherd leaves the 99, knowing they're going to be fine, to go out and actually seek the one. This isn't just paying attention or being concerned with, but actually going out and finding the one. Uh, but how do I know if I'm living a good, faithful Christian life? Well, first of all, get over yourself, because you're ripping up that checklist. And then think of your life as freedom from the have-tos, uh, but more about the get-tos. That the Christian life isn't about what you have to do. It's maybe what you get to do. And the one thing I love uh, as a foundation of Lutheran theology is that we understand that the way that we live our life should be out of a response to God's faithfulness. In other words, what we do, if, you know, good works. Well, what, you know, we, do we want to do good in the world? Yes. Why? Not to earn favor with God, but, to, but as a response to God's faithfulness. Again, not as a prerequisite to earn it. So get rid of check, checklist Christianity. And that relates to this last one. Grace abounds. When uh, Audrey Forbes, um, uh, one of my former colleagues, left, she gave me a plaque that's on my wall. You've probably seen it's the word grace. And she said, um, I think you're a graceful person, but I want you to remember to give grace. And that has been something that's really um, steered me for many years now. Uh, life is uh, too full of rules that keep certain people in and certain people out. As Christians, we often dictate who's in and who's out based on our perceptions and our prejudices um, maybe you've heard the Anne Lamott quote that says, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. <laughs> you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. Uh, that's not it. That's not the God I know. A lot of people say, you know, Christians, we all kind of believe in the same God. I'm like, mm. I hear a lot of Christians talking about a God that I don't know. That's not the God that I that I believe I know, or the God that I worship necessarily. Um, and I believe, in, in terms of thinking of grace abounds, that God's grace is the most important thing. I was in a, a conversation, you might even say a debate with a good friend in college, where we're talking about, like, you know, what's the most important thing in life? Those things you do when you're like a freshman in college, and you're like, <laughs> have all these new time to think about stuff that maybe matters. Um, and she came down, she said, well, faith is the most important thing. And I said, no, I think it's grace. And she explained why faith. And the reason I chose, uh, uh, I said, uh, grace was, I said, because faith can falter. Faith can crack. Faith can crumble. Faith can be challenged. And, even, and when that happens, despite it all, 
the one thing that remains constant is God's grace. Doesn't change. Doesn't fall. Doesn't move. Doesn't crack. Um, and I think it's important to see how we play this out at, uh, in our daily lives, our daily interactions. To talk about it theologically is is one thing, but the teenager who got pregnant doesn't need to hear a list of the consequences of sex. By the way, a lot of teens have sex, just some get pregnant. That's my take on that. I don't know why we... The child acting out because of a crazy family, family situation doesn't need to be told to sit still. Your friend considering a divorce to end an emotionally abusive relationship doesn't need a lecture about faithfulness in marriage. Um, grace abounds. Dispense it freely. You're able to do that. You're called to do that. Um, I think this, uh, it's a good reminder to remember that this doesn't mean that we can get walked over or should be walked over or that there aren't consequences for actions. Things do happen. Uh, you know, somebody explained to me one time, uh, you know, somebody uh, chooses to drink and drive and then seriously injures or, or you know, hurts somebody in, the, in an accident. That doesn't take that away. There's still consequences. So it doesn't excuse things or allow people, or allow us to be walked over. Um, uh, but... Um, but it doesn't mean that we need to move our fences in and build them taller so that we can decide who gets grace and then who doesn't. You ever heard these stories of these old church cemeteries where they bury people in the little white picket fence and then there's uh, people who have died by suicide that get buried outside the churchyard? And some churches over the years have chosen to do one thing, not move the grave, they move the fence. They rebuild the fence so that all are included. All are considered under the um, under the embrace of God's grace. Um, in God's economy of grace, the fences are pushed over, the boundaries extended for everyone, for all time, and it begins with you and me. Grace abounds. And so with that, I want to uh, end by giving a special thank you to all of you for being a wonderful uh, group of students for four or three or two or one year. Some of you, it's just been one, right? I think Aaron and Tamara, year and a half, yeah. Um, you all came at uh, various times in various ways and for various reasons, but you have come together as a group. Um, but the... Uh, um, uh, but the group uh, that's been in this class these past 15 or 16 weeks, again, is, uh, is a great and wonderful way to end. I was telling uh, some of you, I think Sarah earlier, um, this is the class I would want to hang out with in college. I, these would be the friends I would want to have. Um, you have again and again shown your deep love, if not your contagious passion for your future, your professional careers, the love for what you care about. You've learned, questioned, challenged, pushed, pulled, pondered, and then read and wrote and wrote some more and discussed and presented and wrote some more. Um, all that work that has to be done. And for those of you graduating, that work is now behind you. It's complete. It's finished. It's done. But through it all, you've learned once again about the power of life together, living together in community, which isn't always easy, but may we uh, even dare to say that it's necessary to live life together in community. Um, my prayer now is that you will take even a fraction of what you've learned and experienced in this place, that you will hold on to it dearly, that you will go and continue to impact the world as you already have been doing, but now with hopefully an extra boost of confidence, encouragement, and support from your professors, the staff, your mentors, and perhaps most importantly, from each other, from one another. So God bless you. God bless you, Sarah. God bless you. Alicia. God bless you, Amy. God bless you, Michaela. God bless you, Jasmine. God bless you, Catherine. God bless you, Alisa. God bless you, Taryn. God bless you, Jennifer. In the back. God bless you, Nels. God bless you, Megan. God bless you, Jewel. God bless you, Ashley. God bless you, Julianne. God bless you, Michaela. God bless you, Robin. God bless you, Renee. God bless you, Aaron. And my colleague, God bless you, Sue. Thank you. And so if you'll stand, I want to offer this blessing, and then you can return uh, to me. <clears throat> receive this blessing. It will also be a blessing that you will receive, actually, at graduation. Um,
and it's from uh, number six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And we all say, Amen. 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 Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. This is a wonderful way to end. Thanks for a little party, conversation, sharing, and all that. And we really look forward to celebrating with you on Saturday. That will be a grand time. And tomorrow. <laughs>